Uh, okay, good to welcome you all. This is the last talk in uh, the series of talks we put on this term um, as our virtual Hegel Society conference. Um, it would obviously have been lovely to be able to invite all these speakers to an in-person conference, but we are very, very grateful uh, that they've agreed to um, uh, give virtual talks. Um, so the last talk in the series is um, by Frank Ruder, who is Senior Lecturer in Philosophy at the University of Dundee. And I'm especially pleased that Frank is able to join us because uh, unfortunately he wasn't able to join us a few years ago uh, for a live um, uh, conference due to illness. So it's really, really a great, great pleasure to have Frank uh, with us today. Um, Frank uh, writes on an, an enormous uh, and an impressively wide range of topics. Hegel, Spinoza, Lenin, Paris Commune, Marx, Badiou, Zizek. Um, there's a, a tremendous range of material. Um, but three books in particular, I just want to highlight. Um, Hegel's Rabble, um, which is a very provocative and thought uh, provoking study of the role of the rabble in Hegel's philosophy of right. Um, for Badiou, um, uh, Idealism Without Idealism, I think the title is, um, and uh, more recently, Abolishing Freedom, a plea for a contemporary use of fatalism, um, which I haven't read, Frank, but sounds really, really intriguing. So I hope at some point we can ask you about that. Um, anyway, it's a great pleasure to have you here, Frank. I really appreciate it. And I will hand over to you uh, for tonight's talk. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you all for being here and thank you for having me. So what I am um, will be doing today is I will approach a particular or peculiar um, kind of conceptual operation that that occurs um, at one point um, 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 in, in, in Hegel's logic, but it will take me quite some time to get there. And that that operation Hegel calls Entlassen um, in German or or release um, in, in English. Um, and I'm going to begin and um, the, 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 the path that I will be taking, and if I look slightly stupid when I'm speaking, this is just because I'm reading from my screen, so please tolerate my stupid, I mean, my stupid look um, or um, turn off the, the, the whatever look at something nice. Um, okay, um, so um, I'm starting with two quotations. One is from um, a letter of Hamann to Kant, where uh, Hamann writes, we, we need more than physics in order to interpret nature, um Natur auszulegen. Physics is nothing but the alphabet. Nature is an equation with unknown quantities, Berösen, a Hebrew word that is written with nothing but consonants for which the understanding must dot the eyes. Die Punkte setzen muss. And the second one is from one of um, Fernando Pessoa's um, heteronyms, namely Alberto Caero, um, and it, is, uh, it reads, nature is parts without a whole. So let me begin. Greek philosophy, with which for Hegel philosophy proper begins, commences by relating in a specific way to what precedes it. What precedes it, it is, um, is so-called um, oriental, that is Hegel philosophy. The latter is a form of philosophy that is not yet differentiated or emancipated from religion. The form of religion that thereby determines it appears at what Hegel calls natural religion or nature religion. In natural religion, spirit is initially in an, I quote, unadulterated, undisturbed unity, unquote, with nature, which then develops into spirit, identifying something divine manifesting in nature. For Hegel, Oriental philosophy stands in a structurally comparable relationship to natural religion in the way that in natural religion stands, uh, that in natural religion, spirit stands to nature. Oriental philosophy, in short, is the historical shape in which there is, I quote, the natural unity between the spiritual and the natural, unquote. Philosophy proper begins with an act of denaturalization, with the break away from the natural unity of the spiritual and the natural. Now the unity of the spiritual and the natural has itself turned spiritual. But how does this denaturalization manifest? Here, Hegel writes, natural existence has no further value for itself in its existing shapes, unquote, but it's now rather conceived as, I quote again, the mere expression of spirit shining through. Philosophy begins when spirit is able to see the shine of spirit in nature. It establishes a spiritual unity, even though it is still very different 
from what will later become the principle of the modern world, notably the, I quote, extreme of abstract subjectivity, the pure formalism, unquote. Philosophy begins by beginning to think the unity of spirit and nature. By beginning to think the unity of spirit and nature, this unity is denaturalized, and this is the beginning of thinking in the hands of spirit. Philosophy is thus per se by definition and from its very beginning for Hegel a practice of denaturalization. But this does not happen all at once, which is at the same time why Hegel, Hegel's philosophical history of philosophy, I quote again, commences with the Greeks and from the natural philosophy of the Ionic school, unquote, and also why, quote again, these thoughts are scarcely worth observation since they are not yet proper thoughts, neither being in the form of determination of thought, but in that of naturalness, unquote. Philosophy begins um, um, by beginning to denaturalize the unity of spirit and nature. But when it starts to think it, it thinks in such a natural form and mode that thought here is barely thinking anything. Philosophy begins to denaturalize the unity of spirit and nature, but at the beginning, it constantly relies on the natural form to do so. This means that nature is there at the beginning and nature philosophy is thus the beginning of philosophy. Nature philosophy is for Hegel the natural form and mode in which philosophy begins to think without thinking properly yet. Therefore, it can in the beginning look as if it is not beginning, not philosophy, but something else, for example, physics. And this is what Hegel, um, for example, <clears throat> um, claims when, when, when um, 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 with regard um, uh, to, to Thales, um, Thales, right? Um, where he says, for, for us, this does not look philosophical, but physical. But even though what looks as if it is not philosophy yet is the beginning of philosophy, that one should, that one should not trust one's eyes and first impressions any longer, is a sign one is dealing with the practice of denaturalization even at its very beginning. This means that not only does spirit see in nature more than just nature, but even in the natural forms and ways in which spirit is articulating itself, there is more than there appears to be. Philosophy begins without looking like philosophy in search of a form, for and determination of denaturalization proper. But even though philosophy begins not directly as itself and thereby in the form of physical thoughts, this does obviously not mean that all nature philosophy is and must necessarily be understood as an attempt to recommend philosophy. This difference must clearly manifest in different significations of the signifier nature. As is well documented, Hegel engaged almost with throughout his life with nature, even though his actual publications on natural matters are effectively quite limited. I mean, the actual really stuff that he published. And he never published a book on the philosophy of nature. I mean, he published um, the encyclopedia, um, but I mean, that is, that is um, stuff that, that, that um, um, uh, 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 material, teaching material for his lectures, right? Um, which would, <clears throat> um, so he never published a book uh, version of the philosophy of nature, which would not have been purposed in advance as being teaching material for his university course, courses. Some of his engagement with natural methods have even acquired the status of paradigmatic anecdotes, you know, certainly know them all, which are supposed to evidence Hegel's ridiculous views on and treatment of nature, as well as of the natural sciences. One of these stories concerns his early habilitation treatise, his Atatsu Philosophica de Orbitis Planetarum, the anecdote is, uh, you all know that, that Hegel is supposed to have argued a priori uh, that there can be no other planet between the fourth and fifth planet of our solar system, Mars and Jupiter, but on the January, uh, but on January 1st, 1801, a few months before Hegel came up with this, um, uh, his deduction, uh, an astronomer, Giuseppe Piazzi, proved the existence of the very thing that Hegel claimed impossible. The embarrassment of the philosopher's idea, uh, ideas uh, about nature when confronted with real scientific fact is obviously what his, um, this anecdote was supposed to express, even though this can, can be taken to be rather problematic. It is here that Hegel's, again, anecdotal and infamous dictum, also about nature, that, it, that if the facts do not comply with the theory, it is even worse for the facts, appears at first sight to be even worse, an even worse fact for Hegel. He appears to be a kind of modern Thales, but different from his ancient predecessor, he did not fall into the metaphorical this time well while looking at the stars. And because he was so riveted by nature, rather the opposite, 
he made himself into a laughing meta precisely because he was not looking at meta, namely nature properly, but tried to dictate its laws from the outside. Yet Hegel's comment on the Thales uh, anecdote might already point towards a possible rebuttal. Hegel writes about Thales, the people laugh at such things and those that philosophers cannot tell them about such things, but they do not understand that philosophers laugh at them. For they do not fall into a ditch just because they lie in one uh, for all time and because they cannot see what exists above them." Unquote. So when a philosophy of nature makes people anecdotally laugh, this is here Hegel's point, um, um, I take it, the laughter might be the symptom of a more profound disorientation. Let me about where the ditch is, um, the well. Uh, where was there not a fall that uh, still determines our entire existence according to some? About what the laughing matter is, this is the disorientation. Um, and ultimately, maybe even about what laughter is. Philosophy proves itself here again to be a denaturalizing um, 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 uh, operation or uh, practice, looking if not for a way out, then at least for another perspective on the well, on the stage, and thereby denaturalizes, it denaturalizes even the natural ways in which we behave, think, or laugh. There is another uh, well known anecdote that dates back even earlier. But that leads us more directly, I think, into um, um, to examine Hegel's relation to nature. In 1796, Hegel took a trip to the Bernese Alps, and you may all know that. His friends dragged him there, I quote Hegel, in order to become aware and uh, to admire the stunning beauty of the scenery there. Hegel writes a diary. He notes that when passing the Lauterbrunn Valley, I quote, the height of the cliff from which it, the creek cascades has on its own something great. The Staubach, that's the creek, rather not. The spray the creek produces, quote again, has something quaint, unquote. But one does not see in it, quote again, a power, a great force, so that the thought of the coercion of the must, das muss, of nature remains aloof. Rather, uh, unquote, uh, rather what Hegel identifies as, quote again, the animate, in that which permanently dissolves, immer sich auflösende, bursts apart, auseinanderspringende, unquote, of the creek cascading down the mountain is, I quote again, the image of a free play. Nature removes the idea of necessity, but creates an image linked to, quote again, the gracious, unconstrained free downplay, the niederspielen of the spray. Niederspielen of. Um, uh, of the, spread. the combination of the unmoved and unmoving great cliff and the lively small stream endlessly and freely crashing, rushing and dying down in a pile of inconsistent spray creates the image of a free play because therein manifests the very freedom of this connection of stone and water, of the unmoved and the moving, the dead and the somehow animate. It is this concordation that evaporates as if into spray the idea that there's anything necessary in this very concatenation. Nature does for the early Hegel, because of its material composition, where there manifests no necessity, evaporates into spray the idea of necessary connections and inferences. Nature is not at all simply the realm of necessity as it was so often represented. In view of the glacier of Grindelwald, Hegel noted that one does not see, I quote, anything of further interest, unquote, in the gigantic masses. There is no need for a hermeneutic, uh, for any hermeneutic suspicion or deconstructive analysis. Looking at nature demands for any spirited being, I quote Hegel, a new mode of seeing, which gives no new occupation to spirit other than that it notices that it is in the strongest heat of the summer, so close to the masses of ice, unquote. It takes a new mode of seeing to see that nature can combine things in a way that does not exhibit any kind of necessarily, a necessity barely makes any sense and can even generate apparent inconsistency. That does not amount to a contradiction. That is the, what I want to suggest. This new mode of seeing is a mode that avoids seeing necessity and consistency where there is none. It is just seeing what is there um, in its non-necessity and non-sense and nothing else. This implies not to see what is not there and thus to see that what there is, is to uh, see simply what there is to see. Nature is what it appears to be. There is no deeper meaning or anything else behind it. Hegel adds to this after leaving Gutanen, another local village, that I quote, the R, that's the river, does make something splendid waterfalls, does make some splendid waterfalls crushing down with tremendous power, unquote. 
And when traversing a bridge, he notes, on um, a bridge on which one is moistened by the dust of water, and can get, yet can get a good look at the waves of the river, he notes, somewhere else do we obtain, nowhere else do we obtain such a pure concept of the must of nature, from müssen der Natur. There is no must, but a pure need, a must sting, a müssen of nature, and thus a dialectics, one could say, of muss and müssen. It has immense powers that push forward and out of it, they create and spill over. This is what it must do. Yet there is no necessity and thus no structuring must within it. Right? I mean, that's the, the thing I want to uh, introduce. Nature needs and has to produce, generate, create, destroy, etc. But it is on, on another level without necessity. Nature is like a conscious subject that has some pure concept of duty, but one that is so empty even emptier, that it even emptied out the form um, or exploded the form, that there is nothing aligning and bringing together the productions except that they are produced. In nature, we thus encounter a pure need. It must do it without necessity. Uh, there's nothing determining how and in what way, if consistent or not, I miss an onomus. Such necessity without necessity becomes particularly manifest in the shapes of the mountains that have been formed by massive natural forces over almost endless periods of time, but which exhibit no purpose or telos whatsoever. I quote, I doubt whether here even the most faithful theologians would dare to attribute to nature itself in these mountains the purpose of usability to man, unquote. Not even physical theology that identifies and justifies God's existence from nature's creations allows us to see purpose in such manifestations of nature so that Hegel seems to suggest if you want to free someone from especially physical theological beliefs about nature, just take her to the Alps. There's obviously no purpose, no sense, no usability um, to the mountains and its shapes, to the mountain and its shape. Nature can be so unusable that it materializes and indicates in and through its own material appearance, its utter purposeless, purposelessness to men. The message is there that there is no message, and hence the medium, which is none, is again the message, which is therefore also none. Looking at the shapes of mountains with the new mode of seeing, spirit, and Hegel sees no aim or end. One sees only meaninglessness and uselessness. One sees that there is nothing to see. Therefore, Hegel remarks consistently um, that, I quote, neither the eye nor the imagination finds in these formless masses any point on which the former could rest with pleasure or on which the latter could find entertainment or play, unquote. The imagination and even our visual senses are almost suspended because they do not find nothing that would keep them alive or interested. The same holds for reason, which I quote again, finds in the thought of duration or this way of sublimity, nothing that impresses it. The sight of this eternal dead masses gave me nothing but the monotonous and in, in, in its length, tedious in der Länge langweilige idea, it is so, as is so." Unquote. The only thing that there is to think in the formless masses of the mountains, the only thing that nature gives us to think is that there is nothing to think in it. And even this thought has a temporality of its own. To think it for too long makes it boring. It's not a deep thought. Um, that there is no depth attached to it or to which it could refer. With nature, one can only think um, uh, sorry, um, one can only think what is in plain sight anyhow, and hence should only take seriously what the eyes can see. Nature is the identity of being and appearance within which there is nothing else to think than what appears. What is there to think? It is pure superficiality, is the thought specific to the type of a müssen ohne muss, of a need without necessity. Hegel will remain faithful, I think, um, uh, up to a certain extent, to this position in his later life, when, for example, he notes that, I quote, for nature on the surface of which contingency has, so to speak, its free sway, which should also be recognized without the pretension of intending to find in it an instance of being able to be only so and not otherwise, unquote. There is a fundamental, it is like that, this simply because it is like this in nature. It is in the sense that one can say it is contingent in this specific sense. What Hegel later scorns um, in the sphere of spirit, um, 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 namely to accept and interpret the determinations as, I quote, unreasonable or opaque fates as unverstandenes Geschick, it is so, unquote, is precisely the point that he makes about nature 
one could say it is nature's point. Nature is a geschick, it is fortune, but one that is constitutively not understood, unverstanden, not because it is misunderstood, even though uh, it sometimes is, obviously, but because there is nothing in it to understand. We might qualify it as an unverstand, not as ignorance, as stupidity, but as unreason or ununderstanding, which does not simply mark the negation of reason, but a, a peculiar type of absence of it. But this does not turn it into a dark, deep, and ununderstandable mystery or chaos simply. It is fully understood when it is understood that there is nothing to understand, when its unreason is comprehended in thought. So the early, and um, I'm, I'm taking you through a very, very heterogeneous um, series of, 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 of material, textual material, um, and that is purposeful. So um, right, I, I uh, have thought about that before. Um, um, the, the early and pre-philosophical anecdotal concept of nature, one can formulate here is that nature is the material manifestation of unverstand, of unreason, wherein it is important only to think that there is nothing to think in it, but where it is of equal importance not to identify this as a deep thought, as there is no such depth in the appearance or thought of nature. It is well known that during his years in Jena, Hegel worked continuously on developing his system. Within it, nature plays a crucial role. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the entire inner period, but I want to single out um, 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 some, some elements. The still existing fragments of his first Jena system of 1803-04 that form part of the material for his lectures on the um, so-called system of speculative philosophy begin with an extensive elaboration on nature. Hegel moves from the terrestrial earthly system the concept of the earth plays an important role throughout from there, to mechanics, then from chemism to physics, and finally to organic life, which allows and mediates the beginning of the philosophy of spirit. Before Hegel begins the latter, and at the very end of his conceptualization of material, uh, natural phenomena, he notes that, I quote, in spirit nature exists as that which is its essence, unquote. Spirit articulates nature in terms of essence, the dialectic of nature and essence is thus the way in which nature exists in spirit for the Hegel of uh, uh, 1803 or four. This indicates that spirit makes a claim about what nature is and about, and nature never does the reverse. Nature does not say anything about what it is. It might even be indifferent about what it is. It just is. But spirit makes claims about what nature is essentially. Because spirit seeks to grab nature's, grasp uh, nature's essence, it can only speak of nature by speaking of its essence. To rephrase, that there seems to be no nature for nature. There seems to be no nature for nature. Only spirit knows something that it identifies as nature because it articulates nature in terms of essence. So nature essentially exists in spirit as the essentially determined concept of nature. That's the point I'm trying to make. This is to say that nature is a concept that nature itself does not have. Whereas spirit by means of this concept aims to ultimately even comprehend its own nature, its own essence and thus itself. Spirit employs the concept of nature or employs nature, whereas nature does not employ other spirit nor nature. Nature exists as concept of essence in spirit in such a form that spirit articulates by means of the concept of nature, what it nature and spirit essentially is. And in 1805-06, still in Jena, when Hegel has conceived of the first still rather raw version of his final system, it begins in and with nature philosophy. And one could say the system of philosophy, there seems to be accounting for its own origin and emergence in some sense. I'm jumping at um, a few years later in 1808, Hegel teaches a high school class and he teaches his philosophical encyclopedia, a propedeutic setting in which things should be as simple as possible and as succinct as necessary. In paragraph 10 of this encyclopedia, Hegel claims that, I quote, the logical is the externally simple essence in itself. Nature is this essence as externalized and oystered. Spirit is the return of the essence into itself from its externalization, unquote. The three spheres of the logical, nature and spirit, make up the, I quote, whole of science, unquote, and the sciences of nature and spirit are therein the, what he calls the applied, angewandten uh, Wissenschaften, applied sciences. Um, 
um, both apply the logical. In the first part, the logic, Hegel de uh, depicts how the logical um, culminates in the self-determining and self-conceiving form that is articulated in the concept of the idea. At the very beginning of the section dedicated to the science of nature, as he calls it, Hegel states that, I quote, nature is the absolute idea in the shape, gestalt of other being. Uh, in der Gestalt des Anderseins als solchen, gestalt, um, um, of other being as such. Unquote. Nature is the absolute idea is other being. It is being of the ideas other. In the ontological logic, as he calls it, so the part that precedes the science of nature, Hegel noted, and in line with this later science of logic, that we must begin, uh, we must make the beginning of science with, I quote, the whole immediate concept of being, unquote, which ultimately is, I quote again, equivalent to nothing, um, unquote, and in turn creates, uh, quote, a thought of emptiness, unquote, which is, <clears throat> um, that nevertheless is, and therefore brings us back um, to being. You, uh, well, Stephen is the expert on, on that more than anyone else, I guess. Thereby, we end up with um, the um, 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 what Hegel uh, at that point in the encyclopedia when teaching um, 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 at school calls the vanishing of each in its opposite, which ultimately constitutes what he calls pure becoming. The ontological logic starts with being, and after it has run its course, we get an other being too. Right, that's the move that I want to make. We get being and then other being. We thus encounter the othering of the idea, the idea being in its othering. The move from logic to science of nature is thus one from being of the idea to the shape of an other being, it others. This means that nature confronts us with another kind of being, or with another being. I mean, this is a different it's a question of emphasis, I think. Yet it's crucial that this other being is a shape of the absolute idea. The absolute idea identifies itself with, locates itself in, and gives itself to another, even though this other may also be an other to itself. To understand these formulas, it is instructive to see how Hegel elaborates in 1808, so one year after the publication of the Phenomenology of Spirit, what he calls an idea. He designates it to be, I quote, the adequate concept in which determinate being, Dasein, corresponds and spricht to the concept as such, unquote. So an idea is more than just a concept. It is what determines the relationship between the concept and the Dasein of which the concept is the concept and vice versa. I, for example, have an adequate concept if the reality of the thing of which I have a concept corresponds to that very concept in such a way that they are identical, one could say. Sorry for that. For the logical part um, of Hegel's course, this can easily be applied. We must here conceive of a concept whose determinate being I, either way, it is determined in it through a series of other concepts, corresponds to the concept it is, i.e. it has a concept of itself. This purely self-referential and thus absolute structure, Hegel calls, I quote, the, um, again, still the school encyclopedia, the concept existing as concept, unquote. It's a concept that precisely has a reality because it has a concept of itself, a concept that can conceptually articulate and determine what it is because it knows what it is and knows that it knows because it can conceptualize it. In this sense, Hegel can describe the structure as knowing or as absolute idea in, in, in that very um, encyclopedia. We here thus encounter a knowing that knows what knowing is and what it is not, and thereby is a knowing that knows knowing that knows that it knows. It's a knowing, 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 one could say. But how does the structure enable us to read the claim that nature is the absolute idea in the shape of its other being? That's right now the, the, right, um, the task that I set myself. How to other a knowing of that kind? So we have a concept that corresponds to its um, conceptual reality, this is the logical. And now this is again related to an other being, which is why Hegel describes this move in terms of an externalization, but how to understand this externalization. And you see, I'm trying to locate right now what he later will call release, right? I mean, here it is, here it is uh, uh, articulated in terms of externalization. The intricacy of Hegel's claim and what makes made it sound uh, to so many uh, readers so scandalously narcissistic um, lies in the fact that it can, I mean, so the intricacy lies in the fact that it can sound as if the absolute idea would create nature as something that corresponds to it and this underscores what was perceived as the ultimate flaw of, of uh, Hegel's absolute idealism, but you all know these, these charges. Hegel's claim is particularly intricate because nature, 
was supposed to manifest and materialize the far-reaching absence of self-grasp in the previous previous account, right? And even of coherent, potentially um, um, coherent structures. Um, yet it is nevertheless, yet it nevertheless is supposed to be the absolute idea in the shape of its other being right now. So how to square these two claims? Nature does not appear in nature and thus to itself, whereas the absolute idea in its formal composition is what Hegel will later, call, uh, later in his life call, um, I quote, an absolute form which contains the pure idea of truth itself, unquote. So what is here brought together could hardly seem any more incompatible on all levels. But this very incompatibility is, I think, Hegel's point. If the absolute idea names the adequate relation between concept and reality of the concept, we are here dealing with an adequate relation in the shape of another being. Nature, as the absolute idea in the other being, is thus the articulation, as Slava Zizek has uh, once argued, <clears throat> um, of an infinite judgment, similar to spirit is a bone. Um, it articulates an absolute contradiction, as he calls it, which then is not overcome or undone, but will precisely be what spirit is. Therefore, the philosophy of spirit appears as the third part of the system. This is Zizek's claim, right? Um, this means that after thinking gained its most elaborate form and find itself embodied in non-thinking nature. Man, as Hegel will famously claim in his later life, is an amphibious animal because he now has to live in two worlds which contradict one another, the logical and the natural world, one could say, and this is what spirit is. Nature is thus the absolute idea in its other being because neither its concept nor reality corresponds adequately. Right? Neither concept nor reality correspond. The concept of nature is missing in nature from the beginning. Nature is a stranger to itself. It does not know what and that it does not know and therefore is indifferent to itself. It is therefore external uh, to itself as if it were outside of itself. It has no idea of itself and thereby is the external shape of the idea. Right? That's my point. It has no idea of itself. Thereby it takes on itself. We therefore move from the adequate relation between concept and its reality to the adequate relation between the absence of the concept and its reality. Nature is the absence of the concept and this absence manifests in an appropriate material form. It is an adequate relationship because that which does not conceptually grasp itself corresponds to a material reality wherein inconsistency and incoherence um, reigns. Nature does not know what it is and this lack of knowledge fully corresponds to natural reality wherein nothing knows what it is. And it is not the realm of freedom, but of ungrasped necessity or ungrasped inconsistent necessity, you could say. We are still dealing with a necessity without necessity, a necessity that is not all the way through necessary. That's always, um, that allows for contingencies, a necessity that is also blind to itself and thereby in parts set free from the very lawfulness of necessity. This is why I'm, I'm talking about inconsistency because there's both necessity and contingency in nature in this, in this sense. We can thus either understand nature as the adequate relation of that which has neither a proper relation to itself nor to its reality, or as a sphere of non-correspondence of the concept and reality as literal Entsprechung, as unspeaking, undoing of concept and its reality. We thus get two shapes of correspondence of the idea which do not correspond to one another. One is the absolute idea, the other is this idea in its other being. What we immediately state about nature is that it is. It is now the other side of the idea and thereby, if we seek to think through it, we begin with other, with being in nature, with the other being of nature. Again, here anything we say about pure other being will lead us to nothing, which will lead us back to being. This is why we are again stumbling into the concept of becoming or what Hegel at that point in the encyclopedia calls the becoming of nature, werden der Natur. This becoming, he declares, without too much timidity is, I quote, uh, the becoming of spirit, werden zum Geist. And he adds that nature is to be regarded as a system of grades, stufen, of which one arises necessarily um, from the other, but not in such a way that one is generated by the other naturally, but rather in the inner idea lying at the base of nature, unquote. This is to say that the moment we move, we make the move from the logical and it speak in the absolute idea to nature as the shape of other being of this very idea, we conceive of nature from a specific perspective. This is the position of spirit. In the sense, the becoming of the concept of nature is the becoming of 
spirit, right? That's the move we I already made earlier. Right? Spirit uh, relates to nature in terms of um, of, um, of 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 what Hegel calls um, uh, essence, and thereby understands itself uh, through it. We thus look at nature in such a way that we seek to understand how it enables us to formulate a concept of nature, i.e., allows for spirit to emerge. This obviously does not exclude, and that's the move, right? The, from to the concept of nature that I'm emphasizing. This obviously doesn't exclude at all that, I quote, there can even be violations against the determinations of thought, as Hegel says, um, because in nature, the concept are not held together by the unity of one concatenation of thought. Rather, in it, anything can possibly happen on some level. This ought not to irritate the scientific spirit if, for example, I'm quoting Hegel, nature is perverse enough to create some people who blanch from shame and blush from fear, science must not let such inconsistencies of nature deter it from recognizing the opposite of these irregularities as law, unquote. Right? There is inconsistency in there, but it shouldn't irritate us. Looking at nature scientifically by conceiving of it as the idea in the shape of its other being means for Hegel to look at it and seek to determine how it provides the material conditions for the becoming of spirit. In this perspective, nature is regarded as a system of grades. And I quote, the philosophy of nature rather involves the passive attitude of an observer, unquote. We are regarding in what precise way, unquote, the movement of the idea of nature is to withdraw into itself, in sich zu gehen, from its immediacy, to sublate itself and become spirit, unquote. Similarly, Hegel claimed that the phenomenology of spirit um, that was intended to be the introduction to the system, as you all know, which thus was introduced from the very perspective of spirit, that this, I quote, science of the experience of consciousness um, um, necessitated no addition by the scientist, as it were, um, um, but only, I quote, the only thing that remains to us is purely to look on, reines zu sehen. You all know this passage, unquote. Both necessitate near onlooking and their marches are directly at the point within themselves where a shift of perspective becomes possible. We're just looking back with the gaze of an owl almost and seeking to understand how this material conditions of possibility emerged that made this shift possible and that we can only um, account for by shifting the perspective. To put it paradoxically, we look at nature in an almost creative paranoid way so that we see in it what we otherwise would not be able to identify without the scientific case of spirit, namely how it generated that which at the same time must and cannot simply be derived from it. Now I'm jumping ahead. With the beginning of the science of logic, we have moved into the very heart of Hegel's overall project. The material previously referred um, to and just the previous conceptions, um, previous discussions of the concept of nature were all not published in Hegel's day and not by his own hand. But in the logic, we will get the first proper book form account of how to get from the logical idea to nature. This pass is part of the doctrine of the concept, i.e. of the subjective logic and thus of the last huge part of the book. Hegel in general describes the concept as, um, I quote, the truth, of what he names the relation of substantiality, unquote. Um, to elucidate this claim, he turns to Spinoza's ethics, but I'm gonna, gonna not go into this discussion, but it is a, in part a discussion, and I think it's a complicated discussion because um, um, of course, um, what, what stands in the background is Deus Ive Natura, right? I mean, so God as nature, and, and, and this is in, in some sense at stake here in this discussion, I mean, a move from, let's say, nature as substance, to something um, on the basis of nature, uh, I'd say to freedom as um, subject. Okay. We learn in the logic that thinking is a practice that is creative on some level of ideas, ideas of what thinking is, and thereby what we do in the logic is to think thinking by thinking new ideas of what thinking is. That is a very abstract way of rendering, I think, um, the, 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 the pathway of um, its three elements. Um, um, so uh, to think thinking by constantly thinking new ideas of what thinking, um, new ideas of thinking is. That is, I think, the twofold uh, move, I think. This absolute idea, I quote, um, 
The rational concept is the sole subject matter and content of philosophy, Hegel claims. So philosophy is necessarily the philosophy of the idea. Hegel states that, I quote, nature and spirit are in general different modes of exhibiting its, so the absolute ideas, unquote, exist, uh, not unquote, that was just my, uh, sorry, um, uh, addition. Um, um, so nature and spirit are in general different modes of exhibiting its, the absolute ideas, existence, art and religion, its different modes of apprehending itself and giving itself appropriate existence, unquote. Nature and spirit exhibit the absolute idea. I, they exhibit the being there of the thought, thinking, the creation of new ideas of thinking in my rendering. In what is exhibited in nature and in spirit, thought thinks the creation of new ideas of thinking. Nature and spirit are thus different modes of the absolute idea. In the latter, it thinks itself and thus has its reality in the shapes of art, religion, and philosophy. And then it thinks the creation of new and historic historically situated ideas of thinking. But this must also mean that thought also thinkingly creates new ideas of what it is also when it thinks that which does not think, but from which it contingently or necessarily or both emerged, namely nature. The philosophy of nature is therefore, I quote Hegel, thinking consideration of nature. And thinking is um, italicized, the thinking consideration of nature. So in what way can Hegel claim that, I quote, the absolute idea, and this is what he claims, is immediately nature. As Catherine Malabou elucidated, I quote, without this incorporation, logical life remains, would remain an abstraction. It would be a concept, I quote, uh, unquote, would be a concept without reality. In 1817, uh, Hegel claimed that, I quote, spirited being is the absolute idea itself. The concept as the idea intuiting itself is nature. The concept as the idea intuiting itself is nature. To abbreviate Hegel's own abbreviation even more, the absolute idea is embodied in a natural being that therefore when it comes to the concept of itself as thinking being immediately understands that thinking beings have their embodied reality in nature. Thinking beings and thinking new ideas of thinking cannot but come up with the idea of thinking that thinking manifests in nature. This obviously that neither mean that everything, or well, that nature thinks, nor that thinking is simply natural. But if we see to intuit what thinking looks like, to put it like that, right? We merely see nature, something natural, and thus not thinking. Right? We see thinking in its other being, as it were. It is, um, if, um, so if, according to Hegel, the absolute idea is immediately nature, unquote, it is in nature more or less than nature. It is, I quote Hegel, that's right now all, all the stuff is from the logic, the pulse that rises, der Puls, der sich erhebt. Not sublation, Aufhebung of nature, but a rising or elevation, Erhebung in pulse. The absolute idea thus does not show itself in nature as natural heartbeat, but as an elevated pulse rate, if you wish, um, that will drive spirit out of nature. It should be clear that all this does not imply that thought would, I quote again, precede nature in time and bring nature into being through a creative act, unquote. It is rather that thought thinking thought cannot not discover that which precedes thought and from which it emerged. It is important to here emphasize that Hegel does not argue for a knee passing over into nature and a safe and unproblematic passage out of it. When thinking, thinking, thinking starts to intuit, intuit itself as and identify itself in nature, we are confronted with the unsettling aspects of what Hegel calls the impotence of nature, the Omacht der Natur. One could say the without power, ohne Macht of nature. Hegel means by this that, I quote, that it, nature, cannot abide and exhibit the rigor of the concept and loses itself in a blind manifoldness, void of concept, unquote. Looking at nature to pun the famous Kantian dictum, we encounter intuitions without concepts, which therefore are blind. Hegel suggests that this is why I quote again, we can wonder at nature, at the manifoldness of its genera and species and the infinite diversity of its shapes, for wonder is without concept, unquote. This is again the point that Hegel had made already on his trip to the Alps on some level. Nature's arbitrary production and multiplicities, productions and multiplicities, which are without concept and power, suggest a significance that at the same time cannot easily be appropriated by or converted into conceptual investigation. <clears throat> 
So the concept of nature is to, to a certain extent without concept. This is what I'm trying to say, right? And there's something in what we call nature, which inherently is without concept. Or to put it differently, nature is impotent and incomplete. There are gaps, breaks, inconsistencies in it. And therefore, it's, that's now the philosophy of nature speaking. So Hegel's philosophy of nature of the encyclopedia, it sets limits to philosophy, unquote, because it makes us aware that, I quote again, it is quite improper to expect the notion to comprehend, or as it is said, construe or deduce these contingent products of nature, unquote. Nature's productions are so void of concept that concepts have no power about certain parts of nature. And this is less because nature's materiality, but due to its impotence and incompleteness. What can appear as nature's power over the concept arises from its very impotence. We here clearly see a certain opacity that remains in spirit's own understanding of itself, I think. Thoughts own thinking of itself when it starts to conceive of itself also as natural, i.e. as other being. This is not simply a result of its material embodiment, but because this embodiment might not be neatly conceivable within any or appropriable by an overarching consistent conceptual framework. This means that thinking does not properly think, thinking without thinking in completeness and impotence, and hence without that within which there is nothing to think. But this puts even more pressure on how to conceive of the passing over of the idea into nature, which is also supposed to be, in, in Hegel's terms, a creation. And this is now my last bit, if, if I have seven more, maybe maximum 10 more minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so yet encountering limitations in the grasp of the concept because of nature's constitution does not finitize thought. That's important. It rather, I quote Hegel from the logic, remains perfectly transparent to itself. So thought remains perfectly transparent to itself. We even have a concept of that which is in part void of the concept, i.e. nature. But how then does this passage from thought to nature work? Hegel remarks that the logic, das Logische, thus exhibits in the self-movement of the absolute idea only as the original word, a word which is an utterance, äußerung, but one that in being externally uttered has immediately vanished again, unquote. We could say, I mean, the logic exhibiting in Hegel's, Hegel's own description from the beginning, God's thoughts before the creation of the world, right? And right now um, at the very end of the logic, one could say after God thought about the creation of nature and finite spirit, she spoke. She made her thoughts explicit and external, but God's word after it had been uttered immediately vanished. And instead of God's word, we just get an incomplete and impotent nature. This can obviously mean that nature is itself the proof that God, at least as almighty creator whose creation exhibits her very own consistency and perfection everywhere does not exist. And that she strangely admitted it by giving us material proof of her own inexistence. This proof we could then find in the inconsistencies of her creation, right? So that would be the, let's say, um, um, strange um, 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 self-paradoxical um, um, or auto-abolishment, one could almost say, um, of, of, of that idea um, of God. Um, like a world without a concept, mere spiel, drivel, or rambling, nature as form of appearance of what is left of the utterance of God's word after its vanishing, Hegel calls this the abiding Leiben of vanishing, das Bleiben des Verschwindens, um, is actually God's proof that God is dead in some sense. If the logic depicts God's thoughts and ends with her speculative word, the word wherein God reveals itself not to the world, but as nature, and then also as finite spirit, is one that only reveals on some level that there is nothing to reveal, except that there is nothing to reveal. So nature is in some sense an expression, externalization, äußerung, which is void of concept. Now, and that's the re really last point I want to make. Close to the end of the logic, Hegel speaks of what he calls turning point of the movement of the concept. It originates in the absolute idea and consists in, I quote, the demand for an infinite retrogression and proof and deduction, just as from the newly obtained beginning, a result likewise emerges as the method runs its course so that the method would roll on forward to infinity as well, unquote. At the peak of the unfolding of the logic, we, turn, we return to the beginning and repeat the movement since we now have reached a more appropriate understanding of what the beginning of the logic, the beginning and with the entire project that has run its course was all about. Namely, I mean, in my um, very abbreviated rendering, to create a new idea of thought while thinking. To constantly. So we move back and repeat the move forward 
the dynamic of that movement that we then here encounter can be represented graphically with um, the infinity symbol. We determine things increasingly by returning and repeating the movement of the concept, which thereby has become infinite. And in this respect can be taken as one that has the imminent structure of truth through absolute form. And we will repeat this movement not only after we have completed the first repetition, in, but in some sense infinitely. This is why Hegel says, right, it's perfectly, perfectly fine. I mean, it, it doesn't lack anything. Now in this cycle of repetition, there is a movement of exteriorization as Hegel calls it, but also, um, but it also holds that I quote, the greater the expansion, just as dense is the intensity, as if in an almost Nietzschean model of eternal return of the same that contains both the centripetal and centrifugal movement. This is what Hegel calls a reflection into itself. We are thus also bending the movement of thought, thinking the creation of new ideas of thinking back to um, 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 its beginning. And we are now able to formulate the concept of the science of logic because bending backwards and repeating forwards, we totalize and think the entirety of the course we have passed. It is here that Hegel makes the final move, thought's real rite of passage. By creating the concept of the science of logic in its entirety, we cannot but notice that we are still moving solely within the logical sphere. This is a very, I, I, I find this passage very, very difficult to understand and I'm trying to articulate my, my difficulty or my, the difficulty that I'm, I'm struggling with at that point. So, um, or in Hegel's words, we are, I quote, shut up within subjectivity. He says, shut up within subjectivity, unquote. And therefore there is, quote again, the drive to sublate it and pure truth becomes the final result and also the beginning of another sphere and science. Thinking, thinking, thinking expands and contracts, condenses and displaces itself. And then there is the drive to sublate thinking, 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 as if a drive to sublate sublation itself. I mean, that is my um, maybe problematic way of rendering. But this seems impossible. It would bring back what it seeks to overcome. Thought thus cannot deduce material reality from itself, which is why the totality of the movement of the, lo the logic that we just, as if, as a model of thinking placed in front of ourselves, is here supplemented. It's supplemented with another repetition, namely with the repetition of a what Hegel calls a resolve that also plays a role at the beginning, that made, um, 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 uh, that now here um, 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 uh, 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 plays a crucial role, I think. At the end of the logic, it is not the resolve to consider thinking as such, that was the resolve at the very beginning of the logic, but a resolve in another form, a resolve in the shape of another being. Here it is the resolve to consider non-thinking as such, I would suggest. The resolve is a German Entschluss, I, if you take that literally and play a bit and take it as a speculative world, it's literally um, 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 a non-syllogistic opening and underending, um, in some sense, uh, right? A negation of Schluss, a negation of syllogism. And at the end, we resolve, we unend again, um, in some sense. But Hegel, at the end of the logic, uses the resolve in relation to another highly significant end word, after the Entsprechung about which I, uh, I spoke. Um, and um, namely, um, 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 uh, 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 and now I reach the point uh, that I wanted to reach. Um, um, uh, uh, he, he links the Entschluss um, to the Entlassen, because at the end, the resolve decides the free release or discharge of the absolute idea. An Entschluss sich zu entlassen, a resolve to release itself. He literally says uh, the absolute idea at the end. I quote, freely discharges itself, absolutely certain of itself and eternally at rest. One of the most difficult passages, I mean, I think Stephen remarked that somewhere that this is, this is highly difficult. And you, then you suggested, uh, proposed an interpretation. I know um, um, Robert Pippin recently suggested that this is a, a, a passage um, um, which is uh, difficult to make sense of. And um, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna um, take two more minutes and then I stop. Um, so there's an entlassen, an entschluss sich zu entlassen, resolve to release itself. It seems to move, so the absolute idea, seems to move, but is also forever at rest. It leaves itself, but it stays put. To approach this, it's instructive to note that a similar gesture also occurs at the end of the phenomenology where Hegel writes that for self-knowing spirit, just for the, uh, for the reason that it grasps its own concept, it's an immediate equality with itself, 
which in its difference is the certainty of immediate or its sensuous consciousness, the beginning from which we started, the release of itself from the form of its own self is the highest freedom and the highest assurance of its own, uh, of its knowing of itself. But at, and, and at the end of the phenomenology, we do not simply return to its beginning. We also progress to the logic, as we all know. We must return constantly to better to a better understanding of what ju what just happened. But we also progress and begin in another project. The latter we begin, as we know, with a um, in some sense with with the resolve to consider thinking as such. And now I want to say the next step is made with the resolve to consider non-thinking as such. Um, now. The returning movement implies an element of release because it accepts the contingency of the immediate natural embodiment of knowing as what it is. And in this sense, nature, um, that's a quotation, is its living immediate coming to be. So the immediate coming to be, we are, uh, as I argued before, cannot be logically deduced. And spirit now knows, or from a certain point, uh, knows this because it is certain of what knowing is. The progress, progressing movement implies an element of release because therein manifests the knowledge that knowledge knows that knowledge will never be enough to make a beginning in um, and with um, nature. So let me let me um, sum up one one um, one point I I I I, I, I tried to bring out and I think um, um, just in a free formulation. So why I think Hegel speaks of the drive of the absolute idea to realize itself, because the idea, the absolute idea cannot simply create or deduce from itself material existence. Now, this is not a lack, it's not a, it's not a problem, it's not an internal lack of the absolute idea, but thereby it corresponds in some sense to what the concept of nature indicates. Um, so there is still an expression. So um, one could say, at the end, we encounter the expression, God has spoken, but his utterance vanished, of the purely subjective and therefore surprising incompleteness specific to the absolute idea, which is not a proper, right, which is not, which is totally perfect in itself and self sufficient, which manifests in this I, drive of the idea to realize the self. And on the other side, the incompleteness of nature, right, two incompletenesses. We therefore here at the end of the logic encounter two corresponding incompletenesses. The concept of the absolute idea on the one side is driven toward making itself objective, but cannot derive objectivity from its own movement and sublate sublation. This now corresponds to reality of impotence and incompleteness of nature void of the concept. The highest and the lowest, so to speak, here are two sides of the same. The absolute idea is nature. This is what the resolve to release as articulation of the drive of the idea produces. One could say two corresponding incompletes, concept and reality, and too much TWO of incompletion. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Frank. That was um, uh, very challenging and quite exhilarating to listen to. And by all account, looks quite um, uh, exciting and maybe even exhausting to deliver. Uh, but, but thank you very much indeed. I'm sure there will be lots of questions uh, to come. Uh, in accordance with our usual practice, however, I suggest that we take a, a, a five minute break, if that's okay, or a four minute break. Um, so it's now uh, 1833 by, uh, by my account, two years after Hegel died. Um, and so we could come back maybe at you know, 1837 um, uh, and then we can resume the conversation at that point. All right, see you in a minute. Good. OK, well, welcome back, uh, everybody. Um, thanks again to Frank for a very thought provoking talk. I pr propose that we uh, use the yellow hand function. Um, I hope you all, all know how to do that rather than um, using the chat. So um, it's over to you. Uh, if people have got questions, please feel free to pose them. Uh, Virain, I see you're the first one, so please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you very much for this talk. Um, it was uh, very um, exhilarating and and complex, so I don't think I was able to put everything together. And so my, my question is probably going to uh, appear a little simple, but um, I think one of the 
interesting things about the, your talk is the way in which you went from you know, very early parts of, of Hegel and, and how that then slowly in, in some ways still sort of permeates into um, his, his, his later work. And so I wanted to ask you about, you know, the way in which you were using his early experience of the, at the Alps. And it seemed like one of the big things there was a kind of wonder at, of, at nature, almost, you know, something that, that couldn't be grasped by, with, with concepts. And, and it, that would seem to me uh, almost to sound like a romantic view of nature, um, that, that usually we would think um, the later Hegel, because I don't know those early texts so, so well. So, I mean, you would think that the later Hegel had, had sort of gone beyond that or, or changed its position. And, and so this is where I want to ask you about the way in which you are characterizing nature as void of concept, right? And, and because I was wondering whether one could say there's a difference between the self external externality of, a concept, of the concept and being void of a concept. Um, and, and I think that distinction could maybe help us see whether you know, there's, there are other ways to, to, to sort of grasp this or, or to, to put it in a, in a larger kind of context. Uh, do, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? Because there's a way in which if you, if, it may, if you make it void of a concept, it becomes difficult to understand why one would write a whole book on, on it, right? I mean, that, that what, how, does, how does one category go, go into the next and so on when, when you get from space and time and so on? So the, so the self-externality of a concept is actually the, con the concept is there. It's, it's in its self-externality. And, and that seems to be a little bit different. So I was just wondering if you could say something about that. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Thank, thanks so much. So um, I'd say... Um, it, it might sound, um, it might sound the, the early, early bits from, I mean, so it's a private kind of diary, right, that he writes and um, 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 might sound romantic, but I think ultimately it's surprisingly not really romantic because on, on some level he thinks, and this is why this, this as is, so, so it is how it is, right, formula, I think is, is, ex escapes romanticism on some level. I mean, there is something to think in nature, namely that one should not expect that there is anything to think in nature. But that is a totally important thought, right? I mean, that is the move I wanted to make. It's absolutely important to think that there is nothing to think in nature because otherwise one misinterprets. Um, and that is what the what a romantic uh, 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 gesture would be, right? That there is some, I don't know, deep underlying purpose of the shapes of the Bernese Alps. I mean, this is this is what what it, uh, what, what 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 is escaped by that, and that means to to think that there is nothing to think in it is a way of accounting for the self externality of the concept. Right? That was, I mean, that in in your terms, if I if I understand that uh, correctly. But that means to think that nature is the on some level necessitates the self externality of the concept. That also does mean that nature itself does not grasp that. And this is why it's void of the concept, right? So, what, uh, so the self-externality of the concept is thinking that there's nothing to think in nature. On the other hand side, nature does not grasp itself in this very way, right? So nature is void of the concept, but it's absolutely important to think the void of the concept conceptually. And that is the concept of nature, which means this is the externality of the concept, right? And so, so I'm, I, I wouldn't disagree with you, but I would say these two are internally connected. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to think through it. So I'm gonna let other people sort of ask, you know, cause it's, it's a, yeah, um, I, I, see what, I see what you're saying. I mean, I guess just to, to very quickly follow up, I guess the question is, I mean, and it, this is weird because and, and, but I think it's totally fitting because we started this whole conference with a Heideggerian critique of Hegel. And we've ended almost, it sounds like turning Hegel into Heidegger um, because it seems like there's a question, you know, the question that immediately comes here is what is called thinking? What is thinking? What, is, what does it mean to say that there is nothing to think in nature, right? And I think this gets into what what that what that what thinking is for what it means to think nature even for for Hegel and that I think is what's so crucial to the to the end of the but but I don't want to dominate here because yeah but 
Yeah, I mean, this this is what I think the entire. So I, I agree with this approach. I, I I would I think I would separate Hegel from he, Heidegger, um, to be honest. But um, but uh, but I think this is what on some level is at stake at the end of the logic, right? With thinking, thinking it's itself in the act of thinking. I mean, that was my my fully inappropriate but an abbreviated rendering of 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 um um of of what happens uh, after hegel introduces the absolute idea and then all the um further let's say self reflexive um and self determining moves and this moment where the um the drive of the absolute idea to objectify itself right that cannot that 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 plays a crucial role but that necessitates this strange release Right, this entlassen of the absolute idea, um, or more precisely, the entschluss, the resolve to release itself. Um, um, and then in the encyclopedia, to which I didn't get, right? I mean, so I want to emphasize that he, he at the end calls it um, um, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the resolve to release itself in the form of nature, right? So um, very opaque, very difficult to understand formula, but that means that I think there, what, what, Everything, if Hegel is a Heideggerian or not, um, is uh, uh, then uh, determined by what one thinks this release means, right? Um, what what this release ultimately is. Um, yeah. Okay. Stop here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Philip. I think you are next on the list. Just... Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Frank, for a very thought-provoking uh, talk. So I wanted to ask you a bit more about this um, statement you've used that the message is that there is none with regards to nature, because when I hear that, that sounds very much like um, something very existentialist, maybe something like Sartre would say, right? Uh, but then he's not really talking about nature anymore, but he's talking about spirit, about human minded activity. And so it's not really a, a reflection on nature, but it's a reflection on us. So. I am wondering if it's already too much to, in the context of nature to say that there is no message because the kind of being that truly has no message and therefore is fully self-determining and free is the is spirit, right? And so that must mean that there must be some messages in nature, but that those are you know messages of necessity, of determinacy, of natural laws, of external determinations and so forth. So I yeah I'm wondering if I if I'm understanding you correctly or if you yeah, would also like to say something about that, uh, some more about that. Yes. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, on uh, the, the the first points um I, I can make here is I think you one of the the, the 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 points I wanted to make um is that um when we when 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 we're talking here about nature, we're always talking about the concept of nature, right? Um, so that is that seems to, um, and hence whatever we're saying about nature is already articulated from a specific perspective, namely from the perspective of the concept. Now, um, what does that mean? It does not, of course, when, when one finds these passages in Hegel that, that what, what one is trying um, what spirit is trying to do is to find itself in nature, right? To give, to see this is what the system of grades then means, the uh, system der Stufen, right? So it is an attempt to look at nature such that that which is not spirit allows to understand how out of that which is not spirit and which is inherently does not entail grains of spirit, spirit can emerge. Right, so it is a self-understanding of spirit when looking when spirit looks at nature because it. In some sense, it tries to find not itself, but in it, the material conditions for its own emergence. Now, but what does that mean for the concept of nature as such? And that was the point that I was trying to make earlier. Is there already spirits in nature, right? I mean, is, is spirit already inscribed into it? And I think, and that was, and maybe I'm pushing it a bit too far, but the, 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 the point that he makes with the assist tool, right? means, and that is similar to what Byron, um, Byron just um, 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 uh, brought up, um, the, the idea that there, isn't, that there is nothing to think, but it's important that there's nothing to think in nature is a precondition to take nature 
or is a first step to be able to take nature as material preconditions for the emergence of spirit, which is not simply deducible from nature. I mean, let me put it differently. For nature, nothing changes with the emergence of spirit, nothing, right? It's just another thing that emerges. For spirit, everything changes with the emergence of spirit because then there's a, a concept of nature, right? And so we have this strange, um, let's say, uh, almost ontological um, uh, parallelism, one could say. I mean, that's the wrong word, but right, nature, nature is not transformed by the emergence of spirit on some very profound level. And that means nature doesn't want, to, does not want to tell spirit anything. It doesn't, right? <laughs> but spirit, of course, sees something in nature, and and then there is um, then there is a message. But and this is the point I wanted to make. But the important bit is to think that there is no message in nature, and that is precisely the non-existentialist point. But because otherwise, one believes that there is some purpose, some meaning in nature that we can filter out to understand ourselves, which there isn't. This is why we order nature, and this is why then Hegel in the Encyclopedia will come up with, with saying this is why we have natural sciences and so forth. Does that make sense? So one, one, I think this this would be the the, the, the distinction I, I I would 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 emphasize. Okay. Yeah. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Forgive me, it just says A. Schneider. So um, I'm going to invite A. Schneider to, uh, to put a question, please. Hello, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, can we you, can hear yes. you well. Okay, yeah, I can see you. Um, I have a question uh, which somehow, um, yes, uh, aims at uh, going even further than to the end of the other transition, let's say, from the uh, encyclopedia logic to the um, philosophy of nature, namely, I, I'm, I was wondering. I'm wondering in what sense, and if um, if the release, as you were um, developing it, can account for another highly uh, obscure point of the encyclopedia, namely the the, the very last, the third syllogism of uh, philosophy. Um, so let's make things worse and go to the even more obscure <laughs> point of the um, uh, system. And and why? Um, I, I think Catherine Malabou suggested this um, in in her book in in the future of Hegel to, um, to read uh, the the third syllogism precisely as uh, in, in the perspective of the release. Um, and I was wondering always like why 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 she she proposes that. And I think. Um, um, in some sense, um, what what um, the, the the evidence, of course, uh, maybe is uh, that uh, the third syllogism of philosophy uh, is something else than transitioning uh, transitioning as the first uh, syllogism, uh, and also something else than uh, shi uh, reflection, shining. And these two kind of options available, with, which are in some sense the two basic options we have in the logic, uh, th these two basic uh, options for forms of, let's say, an operation or an act or a transition or, yeah, um, a process. Um, these two options are, in some sense, not available also in, in, uh, in the release. And the release is, in some sense, pre precisely that, uh, uh, or precisely this, that these two options are not uh, available. Uh, um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you have, um, if this was, if this is an option for you to uh, mobilize a reading of the release, um, at the end of the logic, in order to um, um, yes make make sense or nonsense of the uh, of the third syllogism of the uh, of philosophy at the end of the um, encyclopedia, and like also how what would this change in terms of uh, uh, a perspective on the system as a kind of like successive uh, um, successive organization of logic, nature, spirit, and so on. Um, yeah, um, okay, I, maybe um, that's enough for, for now, thanks. Oops. Yeah, um, well, thanks. Um, insanely complicated question, obviously, right? Um, um, really insanely complicated question. Um, um, because I think, because I'd say, um, 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 due to, I'm, I'm first saying why I find it insanely complicated and then I'm, 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 I'm saying something about it. I find it insanely complicated because 
we're moving to the end of the encyclopedia with it, right? Um, and we're moving to the end of the encyclopedia with it, which means we're um, moving uh, to a um, part where we're determining the um, systematic place of nature in within an encyclopedic system. And we're, we're being offered three ways of understanding that systematic place, right? Um, namely, well, one could say logic, nature, spirit, we can read in a natural way. We can read in a logic way and we can read in a spirited way, right? I mean, um, so how to get from one to the other, right? Um, and there is only always one direction that's that's important, so it's not reversible. Uh, one, one would be, I mean, uh, in, in your own terms, one of um, almost, um, 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 transition so we leave one sphere behind and get into the other and that that introduces an element of externality in, in these um, uh, elements as well. The second one would um, 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 uh, identify one in the other that would be the reflection bits in, 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 in some sense. And what what is the third? I mean the third but but okay this is why I find it complicated uh, uh, intricate um, of, of course things the two together but what the hell does that mean? Um, Right, I mean, that would be my rendering. What, 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 what precisely uh, does that mean to think that together? On some level, I think the clue is, um, 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 or part of it already lies in understanding what it means to resolve to release one's, right, for, for the absolute idea to resolve to release itself. That is, right, I mean, what, what is that? Because it is a very, very peculiar formulation, right? Entschluss sich zu entlassen, which means there's an activity which implies a certain passivity. I mean, to put it in, in almost metaphorical terms, right? You decide to let go. I mean, and I understand the Heidegger immediately, uh, right? I mean, uh, sein lassen, the, that's the first thing one hears, right? I mean, um, or not the first, I mean, but the second maybe um but 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 i think the end lesson is 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 strange it's not only a zion lesson but 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 it means and that was the attempt and i'm not sure I, if i if i can um there was i think at one point someone gave quite an impressive i think deleuze inspired talk on the three syllogisms at the end uh, here in the hegel society great britain uh, on the on the three syllogism at the end of the encyclopedia um, um so the thing is on online on youtube uh, so um um the, the atlas didn't play a role um at that point um um even though um um it plays a role um um, um when hegel at the end of the encyclopedia literally says um um, um, that the absolute freedom of the idea in the absolute Wahrheit ihrer selbst sich entschließt. So in the absolute truth of itself resolves to release itself from itself as nature. Right? To release itself from itself as nature. Um, and I think this double twofold, right, from itself um, 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 this twofold negation, this right to release itself from itself in a certain form. Um, right. So, what is that form? And my suggestion was, um, and it doesn't say anything about the syllogism. I know, but but, but that is the form. That's the absolute form in its other being. That is, I think, as far as I can, as I can get from 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 that. I'm not entirely certain why, why I'm saying that in that way. Just that you think that I'm totally insane or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm I, I want to say that the perspective of the encyclopedia seems to be at the end of the encyclopedia is a different perspective than the perspective of the logic, and I wanted to emphasize just where precisely does the concept of nature, in that sense appear in the logic, um, which is a book which is structured very differently from the encyclopedia. I mean, I only mentioned that in passing, right? So because it's not a, not a tool for teaching, it's not and so forth. Um, yeah, that was meandering and not a good answer, sorry, but yeah. But it shows why, I mean, it, I, I just performed why I find that a very difficult question. <laughs>
Good, thank you. Um, okay, well, if it's all right, Frank, uh, there are no hands there. I'm going to um, uh, ask you a couple of questions myself, if that's okay. Um, but I wanted to preface uh, the questions by uh, just saying how much I agree with the emphasis on on release. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. And, and I also like the idea of the two incompletenesses. In fact, I think this is often overlooked uh, that the, the uh, that there is something incomplete about about the logic, um, and um, uh, not only with respect to nature, but also with respect to spirit. Um, so anyway, that's just by way of background. Okay, um, I guess my question now these might be unfair. So um, because I'm I'm coming at the logic from from quite a different perspective. But anyway, let, let's try this. Um, you you present the logic uh, if I've got it right as thinking, 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 as as thought thinking itself. Um, and indeed, you just said in response to uh, uh, maybe Philip, was it that, that um, the philosophy of nature is, is about the concept of nature? It, it's sort of not about nature. Well, what if the logic is not just thinking, thinking, thinking? It's thinking being. It's, it, it's doing exactly what Schelling thought Hegel isn't doing. It's thinking the that. It's thinking being. And it's thinking being throughout. It's thinking what it is to be finite to be infinite, um, to be essence, to be concept. And indeed that that's continued into the philosophy of nature, that the philosophy of nature is thinking what it is to be space. It is thinking nature. Of course, it's thinking nature in thinking the concept of nature because for Hegel, ontology is logic, logic is ontology. But if one read it like that, then for a start, one doesn't have the problem, which I have to make doesn't necessarily arise with your way of doing it, of how we get from the realm of thought to the realm of nature. Now, for you, one gets from the realm of thought to the, the further realm of, of, of thought, in a sense, the concept of nature. But I wanted to suggest, I just wanted to see what you thought about that. And, and that would also make sense then of a passage that you don't refer to, which is where he says um, at the beginning of the last paragraph in the uh, Begriffslogik, um, uh, where he talks about the idea um, uh, that sort of sich zusammennimmt in die Unmittelbarkeit der Science. It, it sort of, whatever the right translation is, it takes itself back into or together into the immediacy of being. So we start with being, being expands, develops itself to idea, and then it, it, it forms being again. And he says that is nature. So that obviously that view has to be held together with everything you're talking about with the, uh, uh, with the moment of, 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 of Freisich and Lassen. Um, but I think that's also quite important. So anyway, that would be just a very simple uh, question. Uh, can't we think of both the logic and the philosophy of nature in that sense as strongly ontological um, as about being and about nature? Uh, the second point, which I guess is somewhat related, is really picking up uh, Varane's question uh, and pressing that earlier. Um, so my reading, it wouldn't just be that the philosophy of nature is about the concept of nature. It's about the nature as reason as concept, but with the incompleteness you're talking about. Now you've emphasized the incompleteness, but I guess I wanted to know what you think about the distinctive rationality that Hegel sees in nature. The fact that nature gives itself its own laws. It doesn't give them many of them. You might say, well, you know, mainly Galileo's law of fall and Kepler's law of planetary motion. There aren't many more laws that are inherent in nature, for Hegel, but there are those two. Um, there's freedom in nature, again, an aspect of the concept. Uh, again, absolute mechanism is freedom. Obviously, life is, 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 is freedom as well. So, yeah, could you comment a bit upon, on, on those two ideas, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, at one point, I, I, I tried to suggest that we move, that the move from logic to um, philosophy of nature is the move from on some level being to an other being, right? Um, and I think this this is precisely um, 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 how I would say that thinking, thinking, thinking is being in in in, in the sense. I, I I don't. I mean, uh, so we understand what being is when we get thinking, thinking, thinking. Um, but what does it mean to think? thinking, thinking, thinking. It also means that we need to think another being 
or being or, or thinking, thinking, thinking in its other form as an other being, because that is what that being is. Namely, it is also something that appears in natural form. So I think that is not incompatible with, I mean, what, what, what I wanted to suggest. Now, the, the problem is how to bring these two together. And well, I didn't say anything about how to bring these two together, but right, because I didn't speak about the move from um, um, logic to nature, then to spirit, I just spoke about the, the move from logic to nature. And hence, the next move would be the question how, how to organize these two incompletenesses, right? Um, um, like the incompleteness that is specific to what I just tried to describe, um, even though it sounds a bit Rudlian, maybe um, as uh, thinking, thinking, thinking. I, I, I get, got that suspicion, but um, um, and um, the the incompleteness that is, let's say, the material incompleteness that I try to um, identify in, in in a very abstract way, obviously, um, in, in in the in the concept um, of 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 nature. Um, this is why I, I tried to basically suggest right, um, that um, the, the release articulates a type of Entsprechung of um, adequation of two incompletenesses, right? So it is almost, um, um, but what is an Entsprechung of um, two incompletenesses, right? And, and that is then the question that I think uh, uh, is, is, must be answered when we move to 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 um, to spirit, and this is already moving me into the um, second question that you raised. I think because um, this is precisely how we how we how do we understand the the incompleteness of nature? I mean, it's not total chaos. That would be mad to say that, right? Obviously, not. Um, but it's not total. So so this incompleteness is essentially an incompleteness of a very specific kind. I mean, of course, there are fragments of rationality. I mean, obviously, and and and, um, and there are even laws, absolutely. Um, and there's self-organization and self uh, types, certain types of self-determination, and, and and of course, but it is on some level, and there are certain necessities, and right. Um, but but essentially, the incompleteness means that one gets. Um, so what, why I emphasize the impotence of nature, the Omach and Natur, right, is because it is the inability to totalize itself on some level, to grasp itself, to, to, um, to um, um, make itself um, generally coherent. But, but that is then the twofold task, how to bring together to the twofold task that I, I'd say um, is put um, 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 into the sphere of, 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 of the philosophy of spirit, how to bring together, how to make coherent on some level, um, the, these two types of, in, that are very fundamentally different, right? I mean, the incompleteness of, 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 that we encounter in the logic is a very different type, um, is, right? Is the other, other, is a different type uh, of incompleteness than, than the incompleteness that we encounter in nature. Um, 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 but, 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 but the question is how to organize, how to make sense of how to bring together these two. Um, and part of that is, of course, done through natural sciences. For example, I mean, I think this is where I would then place what he actually is talking about uh, when he, when he, when he, when he, um, and um, if that is materially accurate or not. But, 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 but right away, that is then where I would systematically position um, the philosophy of the natural sciences. I hope that makes sense. You're muted. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, just one uh, follow-up thought, because we are we are um, past uh, uh, seven o'clock. But um, listening to you, I wonder if it would be fair to say that, in your view, there are, in a way, two incompletenesses in nature, and that one of the incompletenesses would be its 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 inability to think itself. But the other one would be that very moment of contingency which of course we find also in the realm of spirit that logic cannot derive Krug's pen. Um, and indeed we find that incompleteness in the logic itself. I'm just obviously been working on the logic of measure, but in the realized measure, um, there's a, a section called Das Physikstein in Masse. And that is about a moment of irreducible contingency of a, just a given number that is inseparable from the laws, for example, of you know, Kepler's laws. Um, 
Uh, and we see this, in fact, even if the laws that govern planets in different systems are the same, the actual numbers involved will differ and they are not derivable by logic. So in a way that that element of incompleteness in nature is already thought as part of measure, for example. Would it be fair to say there are those two incompletenesses in nature for you? No, I, 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 I like, I mean, um, maybe, maybe, um, 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 maybe that is the devil's trap or whatever, <laughs> and I'm, I'm entering the abyss, but I, I find that find that quite plausible, um, um, simply because, um, well, I mean, there's this passage where, where Hegel suggests, right, I mean, that, that, that it's impossible to do, to deduce why they are, I don't know, I'm making, making that up, yeah. why there are 377 and not 378 uh, of, um, of types of turtles, right? I mean, it is it just 67 like, species of parrot, I think. Exactly. Um, so, so it is even a useless, <laughs> and in this sense, right, I mean, in this sense, there's nothing to think there, um, right, um, in nature, but it's important to see that there is nothing to think, because this cannot be derived from yeah. any, right? Um, and in this sense, this type of contingency and the fragmentary or incoherent aspects, uh, yeah, um, maybe the incompleteness is inherently, the natural incompleteness is inherently so incomplete. I hinted at that at one point mm -hmm. when I was talking at the, uh, about, the, about the school encyclopedia uh, from 1808, where, 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 where um, um, Hegel, Hegel suggests that, that there is no organization of, let's say, um, 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 it's so fragmentary that it's not clear if the relationship between necessity and uh, consistency is inherently necessary or consistent uh, or yeah. contingent. Sorry. Um, so, uh, yes, I no, I agree with that. Good. Good. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. I think at that point, uh, please uh, join me in thanking Frank for a truly uh, um, enjoying and exhilarating talk. Thank you all. Thanks for having me and thanks for enduring this. Uh, before you all go, um, can I just um, uh, give a few more thanks uh, as well? Um, first of all, uh, and I mean, maybe first of all, in terms of the, the sequence, but also in terms of the, the work that's gone into all of this to Philip uh, for helping organize these sessions, for, for looking after the technology, setting up the Zoom. So thank you very much, Philip. Uh, we couldn't have done this without you. And, uh, and we'll hope you'll stay with us and do this again sometime, maybe. <laughs> Thanks, happy to, happy to help out. Um, secondly, uh, to Bob for chairing some of the sessions. Uh, it's been really uh, good to be able to share this. And um, so thanks very much um, to Bob for that. Um, thirdly, to all of you that have taken part in this, uh, it, I mean, obviously these, these events don't, don't really come alive uh, if, if people aren't watching and listening and asking questions. And it's been very good to have you all involved. Um, and uh, on that note, I want to uh, rather cheekily suggest two things, that if any of you are interested in becoming members of the Hegel Society of Great Britain uh, and, and reading our wonderful Hegel Bulletin, along with the Isle of Manoeuvre, of course, I don't want to uh, diss the Isle of Manoeuvre, uh, then we would, we would love to have you as members. Um, and finally, just to draw your attention to the fact that all being well, we will have our Hegel Conference, Hegel Society Conference in Oxford next year, in September 2022. Uh, next year's conference is uh, delayed um, by a year. Um, it's being held with the uh, Internationale Hegel Vereinigung um, and will be on Hegel's philosophy of right. So uh, we hope to see some of you, whether you're members or not, um, you're welcome to uh, attend that. Um, so we hope all being well, we'll be able to see you in Oxford. Um, and at some point next spring, maybe earlier in the spring, uh, there might, uh, there will be, in fact, uh, a, a call for abstracts for an early career session. So if you count as an early career, that's that's PhD or post PhD, but not too far, then we, we have a session uh, devoted to early career uh, um, researchers and uh, there will be a call for abstracts for that. Um, so, okay, so thanks very much again. And uh, a final round of applause for Frank and then uh, I wish you all a very good evening and a very uh, good Christmas vacation and uh, hope that 2022 is an improvement on the last couple of years. Okay, all the best.